welcome to the Bread of Life Bible Study. I'm your host, Pastor Derek Thomas, and my prayer is that the Bible study today truly blesses you, strengthens you, encourages you, and teaches you how to be a carrier of the bread of life for a dying and sin-sick world. God bless. Praise the Lord, LWM family. This is Pastor Derek Thomas, and, and truly, we're blessed with another opportunity to be a blessing to God's people. God wants to use us mightily on tonight, and, and he wants to, to use us to truly teach others how to live in this current church age in a way so that lives are truly changed and so that hearts are truly touched in the name of Jesus. And, and we're noticing as we walk through this series that we're learning about different character traits that the church carries. And we're learning that these seven churches are so much more than just seven institutions. There's so much more than just seven bodies. These seven churches embody the personality, the persona of the church in so many different stages and so many different seasons in life. And God is calling us and he's challenging us to truly make a difference and truly make a godly impact in the lives of others. So, so tonight we want to, to jump right in and we want to continue in the midst of our series. And we want to look tonight at uh, the church of uh, Pergamum, uh, the, the, the church of, of, of Pergamum, and, and, and God desires to, to speak to us about what's going on with that church, and more importantly, what's going on within us as it pertains to that church. So we're talking tonight about the church at Pergamum, and the church at Pergamum has a, a very, very rich history. Uh, if we start looking at the history of the church of Pergamum, we see that the Church of Pergamum, also referred to in the Bible as Pergamos, the Church of Pergamos, for, for the, the Greek dynamic, is it was founded by Greek colonies several centuries before the time of Christ. So it was a city that was around, the city that uh, uh, was located in the, the Caceres Valley uh, in its former state of Pergamos. That was about 50 miles north of Smyrna, about 15 miles inland from the Aegean Sea. It was, uh, I would say, a, a mid-tier city. Chicago has the nickname of being the second city, which is where I'm from. And, and, you know, a lot of us took that to heart in that it's called the second city when we have so many of the advantages and so many of the things that cities like New York and L.A. that are classified as tier one cities have, yet it's classified as the second city. I'm here to let you know that there's nothing wrong with being classified as the second city because a classification is what man deems you as but the reality is what god has ordained you to be and we have to understand that 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 like the church of pergamos god has ordained us to be something great uh it was it was founded again by greek colonists and and its calling card was art and literature art and literature were encouraged and in the city there was a library of over 200,000 volumes and, and later uh, Antony gave those volumes to Cleopatra. So this was not a city that was poor at all. This was a city that was truly, truly wealthy, truly wealthy naturally, truly wealthy spiritually. But even in the midst of those things, there were still some challenges that were faced, kind of like us today in the church. What we find, beloved, is that we are blessed with many gifts. We're blessed with many talents. We're blessed with a host of graces that God gives to us. And by no design of our own, yet by our own doing and our own fault because of our own volition, we find ourselves in positions where the enemy would love to do nothing more than to come in and to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, several suggestions have been made because there was a phrase that was used in verses uh, 12, through, through 13, uh, uh, verses uh, 12 through 17, rather. And the phrase, particularly in verse 13, was, was, was the, uh, 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 the, the throne of Satan, or Satan's throne. And several suggestions were made to explain that reference in this passage of Scripture, because that's a heavy-duty reference. That's something that you don't take lightly. And that's something, beloved, that you don't really throw around. To be equated with Satan is serious business. And the challenge here, with the Church of Pergamum, is that even though it had so many things going for it, it fell prey to its own mindset because it would set its mind 
on things that were carnal. And in setting its mind on things that were carnal, it would allow the deep things of God to bypass it and the inhabitants of the same be bypassed by it so that they're left wanting and left lacking. And though the art and the literature abounded, uh, the suggestions here by the region being called a, a Satan's throne uh, and, that, and that throne being located in Pergamos included the altar that had been set up to a pagan god named Zeus. Uh, he was a, a wonder in the ancient world. He, he was a Zeus that, that uh, from my study, it looks like the, the, the Greek god Zeus was, was ultimately patterned after. Uh, if you notice that Greek god Zeus, if you know anything about mythology, that Greek god Zeus actually had relations with human beings. So there was interaction, intimate interaction in the physical sense with, with human beings. That's how gods like Hercules were made. And, and that was something that was kind of not supposed to be happening. And in addition to that, the, the, the worship of uh, Asclepius, which is a pagan god of healing. And many people came to Pergamos because of that healing dynamic. And, and the whole collection of pagan temples at the city were, were on display. And the fact that Roman emperors were, in fact, there and worshipped was on display. What are you saying? What I'm saying is in, in times like today, you have situations like this. Individuals where people go to a church and seek to worship the man or woman of God more so than the God that placed the man or woman of God in the office that God is allowing he or she to function in. The reverence is going to the man or to the woman, hanging on every word that the man or woman says, instead of seeking and petitioning God for the word that he placed into the mouth of his chosen vessel for that moment. When we allow the attention to be shifted from God where it belongs to man where it does not belong, we're beginning to fall into a Pergamum mindset, a Pergamus mindset. And in that Pergamus mindset, it leaves you void of the will and void of the desire to fight. It leaves you just wanting to kind of go with the flow. You begin to let your inhibitions down and you just do what you like. You do what feels right. You do what feels natural to your flesh, to your carnality, to the, to the things that are far lower in level than where God desires us to walk and where the God desires us to function. God is in a constant state, beloved, of calling us to come up higher. He wants us to come up higher in our worship. He, he wants us to come up higher in our praise. He wants us to come up higher in our faith and in our diligence and in our activity and in our movement. That's why he's calling us to draw near unto him because when we draw near unto him as the word says, he'll then draw near unto us. And as he draws near unto us while we're drawing near unto him, a great exchange takes place in that intimacy. And in that great exchange, the seed that's passed between the two entities. We're the receptor of the seed. And the seed that, that God pours into us is seed that's designed to bless us to grow and to, to bless us to prosper and to, to bless us to be fruitful and to multiply, to, to bless us to be a blessing to others, to bless us to bless those that bless us and to curse those that, that, that seek to spitefully use us, that the, the, the blessing that God has for us to truly change our lives is housed in this great exchange. But this great exchange does not come cheap. This great exchange comes with the cost, and the cost is what we want to talk about tonight in our study time. The cost is a key church lesson for us, a key church lesson for us that the letter that Paul wrote to the church of Pergamos shares with us today. And that key lesson is for us to resist Satan's influence, even to death if necessary. We got to catch that. We got to be, be willing to fight to the death for what we believe in. We got to be willing to fight for our right to live and to move and to have our being and to, to worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness. We got to fight for our right to, to be victors and not victims because God would love nothing more than for us to stand as victors in the face of the enemy. The enemy, conversely, would love nothing more for us to cower in hopelessness declaring ourselves as victims because the Bible lets us know that we're to give thanks because the word says thanks, but thanks be unto God who's given us the victory through his son, Christ Jesus. We're to give God thanks in our dealings and to stay away from the Pergamos mindset. And we got to stay away from the Pergamos mindset because in our resisting, the resisting 
is designed to draw us closer to him, not further away from God. And you may say, well, well, Pastor, why is this lesson so important for us? It's so important for us, first of all, because we've got to get comfortable in making God the main thing in our lives without apology. Amen. Without apology. We got to be willing to say, God, you're God and I'm not. And because you're God and I'm not, I thank you for being bold in each of us. I thank you for blessing me just as much as you bless my wife, even the more so, oh God, bless my wife and you bless me, oh God, because I know God that any way that you bless me, I'll be satisfied because however you bless me, you're going to be lifted up and your name is going to be magnified and your name is going to be glorified and people are going to bow down and worship you, not me. So God, you take it and I, I give you the honor and glory and I'm unashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm unashamed to tell the world that I indeed serve a risen Savior that's in the world today. That's where God desires us to be. And when we look at verses 12 and 13, it speaks to that. It says to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write these things, said he which had the sharp sword with the two edges. In other words, the word of God is in the mouth of our Christ. It's in the mouth of the anointed one. It's in the mouth of the one that's been called to intercede for us. But what we've got to be willing to do is come up higher because in coming up higher in our existence and in our functionality, beloved, that's where victory is. God desires us to walk in full and complete and unashamed and unapologetic victory because victory indeed is ours because we're the ones that have overcome by the blood of the lamb we're the ones that overcome daily by the words of our testimony we're the ones that continue to overcome and to 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 do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that's at work in us we got to realize that there's a dunamis power a god-given power that's at work in us tonight there's a God-given power that's at work in each and every one of us that's designed to make us better. But so many of us want to walk around bitter. And it's amazing how one letter can change the complexion of an entire word. Yet so many of us miss it at so many different levels with so many different letters to spell out so many different things that God is desiring us to make him the main thing in our, in our lives without apology it's not about the number of times i pace the floor it's not about the number of times that i say uh, uh, good morning in spanish and how are you in spanish it's not about the number of times that i hold the door open for my wife or that i'm seeking to be a blessing for god's people what it comes down to is our willingness to make the main thing which is god in our lives Continue to do so without apology. Continue to do so without disdain, without destruction, without despair. And that's why it says here, to the angel of the Lord in Pergamos, right? These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with the two edges. I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. And you hold fast my name and have not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan well so we see here that the dialogue and the discourse is taking place and as it's taking place and as jesus is dictating to john the baptist he's making it clear that he christ is so much more than just the alpha and the omega than just the beginning and the end than just the first and the last and many times individuals that cheat that get to the finish line and look so refreshed are there not because they ran the race with patience they're there because they may have run the race in a vehicle, in a taxi cab. They may have run the race with a friend of theirs. They may have run the race however they may have done it. But they ran the race in such a fashion so that they unashamedly picked their prize. There was no shame to their game, church. There was no shame to what they were looking to do because in their minds, they were doing what comes naturally. And I need you all to understand and grasp that. God is calling us to do what comes naturally in serving him. We got to do what comes naturally because in doing what comes naturally, we're positioning ourselves to make a divine impact in the lives of our brothers and our sisters. And God wants to do great things. He wants to do 
mighty things. He wants to do awesome things. He wants to do fantastic things. He wants to do things that, that are above and beyond our comprehension, above and beyond our understanding, above and beyond anything that we could ask or even think because it's according to the power that's at work in us. And that's how God desires to function in our lives. He desires to function in us and, and desires to function through us because it's about him. It's, it's not about us. And as we come to realize and understand that it's about him and it's not about us, and we begin to understand the value that God carries in a scenario like this, we'll not hesitate in making God the main thing in our lives. And we won't be sorry for it. We'll not hesitate in taking time to pray before we do anything. We won't hesitate in taking time to, to say God bless you because we indeed want God to bless our brothers and our sisters because as God blesses our brothers and our sisters, blessings are making their way to us. And this is where this letter is so poignant for me because in no uncertain terms is Christ breaking down the fact that, look, I know what's going on. I know what you did. I know where you are. I know the situations and the circumstances that you find yourself facing, that you find yourself addressing, that you find yourself dealing with. I know all that stuff. And in the midst of knowing all that stuff, I, God says, love you anyway. And I, God says, I'm still here, ready to do for you just as I promised. And all I need you to do is meet the condition. What a mighty God we serve. What a God that's so mighty not because of his stature, but because so many men and so many women have, have, have made the decision to make God the main thing in their lives and to not be apologetic about it. Whatever that main thing is, as you take the initiative to make God the main thing in your life and do so unapologetically, I'm a living witness to let you know that God will begin to move on your behalf God will begin to bless. He'll begin to offer the sevenfold Isaiah blessing upon your life. And as the Lord begins to pour out his spirit truly on all flesh, we have to be wise enough to make good decisions. We got to be wise enough to be spiritually mature in dealing with this thing. Being spiritually mature in our walk and in our witness so that as we go through this, the one that has a sharp sword with two edges as a tongue will not find himself cutting us up like so many do in church. We find ourselves cutting up those people that we feel have wronged us. When God is calling us, instead of cutting them up, to, to cut them in on the action. Cut them in on the action of a love relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Cut them in on the action of, 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 of having victory and abundance and superabundance. Cut them in on the reality of the blessings that come with serving unapologetically. See, God wants us to get it and keep the main thing, the main thing, because as we continue to keep the main thing, the main thing, what God begins to do in the midst of our doing that is he begins to, to, to move mightily and begins to open our eyes, to do like the song says, open the eyes of of our hearts, Lord, because we want to see him. Yet in the midst of seeing him, he's going to show us ourselves in a very real and very intimate way. And we'll not have the luxury of having furs or having coats or having skins or having anything of any sort covering us up other than just our base clothes. And there are some that even have their base clothes running around them. But God desires us to understand that we've got work to do. We got to admit first that we're sinners. We've got to secondly admit that we need salvation. And most importantly, we've got to wish to desire to share with others the same great news. Because what happens is, is, what, is that when people begin to come together and begin to share and become to fellowship, especially if food is involved. If there's someone that has an ulterior motive, the atmosphere has been made so conducive because of the fellowship and the camaraderie that they fool around and let a bone slip out that wasn't supposed to slip out. But God knows what's happening. And because God knows what's happening and because God understands and knows how it all works, because he created us in his image and in 
his likeness, because God created us the way that he created us, his design is for us to follow the premise that the 12-step program laid out, because I don't know if you, you realize it or not, but, but the 12-step program is based in scripture, and the very first step in an effective 12-step program participant is admission. Is Admission is the first step towards recovery, and there's so many of us out here that are functioning with a Pergamos mindset, functioning with a mindset uh, of, of thinking that we got it all together, thinking that we're doing it all right. But in the midst of giving out the, in air quotes, I put blessings that we're giving out, there are curses mixed in. Uh, another way to put it is this, individuals that are that one that 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 love the Lord, in, in air quotes, but they're nice to, to everybody. Comes across as nice until it's really dissected by the person that's receiving it, and the barbs are in there, and they're not too far under the surface of what was thrown. Because the individual that threw it wants you to feel the barbs. Those barbs are meant for you. And I need you to catch this because this is critical in the spirit. The barbs are meant for you and because your enemy is throwing them. But the, the, and the barbs are meant to be hidden underneath the surface. So they can't be seen doing the damage. Because if they can't be seen doing the damage, all individuals are going to rely on is what they see. And because we're all sinners saved by grace, we all are flawed. We all are misfits. We all need to let our lights shine in such a fashion so that men and, men and women might see your good works in us, Lord, and give you glory. But that can't happen if we're not willing to admit that we're sinners. I can't talk about walking a saved life. I can't talk about living in the fullness of salvation. I can't talk about I'm walking in victory. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm walking in victory if I'm not admit. If I've not taken the time to admit that, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. And that's a hard conversation to have. But I'm here to let you know from personal experience that it's a necessary conversation that's had. Because when that conversation is had, that lets everyone that's seeing you, everyone that's hearing you, everyone that's in your presence, no one understand that there's something different about you, that there's a whole nother level of commitment that you made to God. And when we make that next level of commitment, God is expecting greater of us. Not only greater in number two and greater in number and greater in magnitude, but 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 greater in degree of, of grandiose, greater as far as it being undeniably God. But what we got to realize and, and, and wanting to be in that place is that that place and being in that state of undeniability always comes. Without a price. We got to realize that the price is there. And we got to be willing to pay the price. And being willing to pay the price means that we've got to allow God to pull us out of our comfort zone. He may have us doing something that seems absolutely foolish to us, especially if we know our agenda. But what happens in those instances is that God's agenda trumps our agenda, and God's agenda can do it in so many ways, whatever he desires, because God is sovereign. It uses here the, the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. So we see here the relationship between Balaam and Balak, and we know the story of one, every time one wanted to curse the one, every time the one wanted to curse the other in warfare, he wound up blessing and blessing him, and blessing him. And guess what? When all those blessings went up, God had to perform. He had to move, and he had to perform in a way that truly was an inspiration and truly was a blessing. And we got to realize that God desires to do so much in us and through us, and he wants to use us to share the gospel with other people. And he wants to use us to truly give us the measure of salvation to match the measure of faith that you've given. I want you to go forth, God is saying. I want you to make a difference, but I need you first to admit that you need me, God is saying. There are far too many of us that have said yes to Jesus that, oh, okay, God, I got it from here, thank you. And then we jump out and take off. And God is saying, but I'm not through with you yet. See, God isn't through with us by any means. 
God is not through with us yet, church. He's not through with us yet. He's not through with us yet. He desires to do great and marvelous things in us and with us and through us, not for our glory, but for his glory. So we got to admit that we're sinners. We got to admit that we need salvation. We got to admit that we have a desire to, to, to share the same with other people. And being in admission means that we're going to have to be on the outside, looking in once again. And that's not always an enviable position to be in. That's actually a position that, that, that carries great disdain, but it carries such great weight and such an awesome, awesome reminder of the God that we serve. So we have to admit that we're sinners, that we need salvation, and that we have a, a, a desire to share the same with other people. That's what we're going to be doing when we get back to our mission field. That's what we're going to be doing down at least point. We're going to be moving in such a fashion so that everybody knows who we are. Everybody knows where we came from. Everybody's going to know who unit, uh, who, who uh, uh, Living Witness Ministries is. Everybody's going to know. And the way that we let everybody know is by the, the, the next thing here. I would say the, the, the most important thing here. And that's maintaining an open ear an open heart, and an open spirit towards God. Amen. We've got to realize and understand that, that God needs and desires us to be open. He so desperately desires us to be open that, that he would rather end us in our current destructive state than to leave us in a state where we can cause harm and destruction to so many more because we've made the choice to self-destruct. In essence, that's what it's saying here in verse 16, where it says, repent or else, I'll, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. We got to understand that the very thing that we use here on earth, the Bible talks about as a, as, as a small member, but it can do great damage, as I paraphrase. That's the tongue. We dare want to get into a, a shouting match with God. We dare want to go word for word with God. Those that are parents, you all understand and know how it is when uh, the first time that that our kids try to do that with us, go word for word with us. We had to quickly correct them. We had to quickly let them know, hey, that this this isn't how it works. We 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 had to quickly not spare the rock so that the child might not be spoiled. We had to come to grips with that and deal with that thing head on right away. We had to deal with that thing up front. We had to deal with it right then and right there because if we did not deal with it, it would wind up dealing with us in a much harsher and much more destructive fashion. The enemy wants to steal and kill and destroy. We've talked about this as a church and we've prayed about this as a church. And, and God is desiring us to see and understand that it's real. Church is real. As we prepare to go into the region, to go into our next phase of outreach, to go into our next uh, uh, Soul Search weekend. We want to go in with the fair mentality, knowing that God can do bigger, God can do better and greater. We've just got to have open ears and hearts and spirits that are towards God, open towards God and open to the things of God and open to hear the voice of God and open to hear the mind of God. Because when we hear the mind of God and we hear the voice of God, it begins to give us insight on the heart of God. And when we get insight on the heart of God and we allow God's heart to supersede our heart, then the driving force that is God, the spirit of God, if you will, begins to dwell in our spirit. And we then take on the likeness and image of God and can be used in the earth to make a supernatural impact. That's why it's so critical for us to maintain an open ear, heart, and spirit. Because at every level, at every level, it's making a difference. At every level, it's making an impact. At every level, it's doing great things. And we got to understand that at every level, God desires to reach us and desires to change us and desires to bless us and desires to meet us where we are so that we can truly be everything that God has called us to be. Amen. He wants us to do great things. He wants us to listen to his voice, not just hear it, but truly 
listen to his voice. Be do be be doers of the word and not hearers only. He he wants us to do great things, but more importantly, he wants to do great things through us. And that's where it can get really, really tricky. Because the enemy tries to come in and, and steal that thing and or kill that thing or destroy that thing by throwing in doubt or throwing in fear or throwing in feelings of inadequacy or throwing in feelings like, well, God could never love me because I did thus and so. That's precisely why he loves you, because he knew that you were going to do thus and so. That's why God so loved the world, as John 3, 16 says, that he gave his only begotten son, period. God knew the mess that you were going to be. God knew the mess ups that you were going to make. God knew what we were going to blow it at every turn. But because he's God and we're not, he, even before he met us there, he went ahead and made sure the debt was paid. So that before the debt was even incurred, the balance was already paid. So it was like it never happened. That's how God moves in our lives as it pertains to sin. When we're walking uprightly before him, when we have open ears and, and, and hearts and spirits toward God, we have a mind and a will and a resolve to serve God. And when we serve God and truly serve him with our whole heart and truly serve him with our whole mind and truly serve him with all of our strength and with every aspect and fiber of our being, that's when God can come in and begin to make wholesale changes in our lives. That's when he can come in and truly do the redecorative work that he wants to do in us. He, he, he can come in and truly create in us, as we pray, a clean heart and truly renew a right spirit that's in us. Because he knows that if we're left to our own devices, if he allows us to have access to the devices that he has to truly bring about the cleanliness that brings us next to God, we'll take it and we'll abuse it. We'll take it and we'll maluse it. We'll take it and we'll seek to, to lord it over other people and we'll seek to hoard it and we'll seek to, to sell it to the highest bidder. That's not what God is about and that's not what God desires for you and I, beloved. God desires greater and he's calling us to do greater. He's calling us to something greater. He's calling us higher so that we can do greater because as he calls us higher to do greater, what he does is he begins a new work in and through us. He begins a new work that he wants to make us a part of. That's why it says here uh, uh, at, towards the end of the verse that to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden man and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows except he that receives it. In other words, there are going to be some that are at a church mindset where the enemy is just running roughshod and it seems like it's all hell all day, every day. But if you're willing to stand and if you're willing to be that lightning rod that's willing to, to, to catch enough light and to let their light shine so much, what will happen is God will begin to build a conductor, a superconductor, to not only conduct the current of the natural in the form of electricity, but even more importantly, to, 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 to conduct the current of the spirit, which is the anointing of the Holy Ghost that God has ready to impart upon each and every one of us that believe, and to take that anointing and to saturate every aspect of our being with that anointing so that our ears and our hearts and, 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 and our spirits would be turned towards you, God, turned back towards you, God, through Jesus, the Christ. We have to understand that God desires to not only establish, but maintain a quality relationship with each of us. That means in the best of times, we're giving glory to God. In our worst of times, we're giving glory to God. In our most fearful times, we're giving glory to God. In our most uh, uh, um, spoiled moments, God wants us to still give him glory. And we can. We can by lifting up, holding hands in a sanctuary that's worth, that, that's worship in the traditional sense, but the practical sense is lifting our hands to find our hands to do the work of ministry necessary to make a godly impact in the lives of others. That might be buying some gas for somebody. That might be helping somebody with groceries. That might be offering a word of encouragement. 
that might be taking a moment as unctioned by the Holy Spirit to pray and as further unctioned by the Holy Spirit to prophesy that they even more further unctioned by the Holy Spirit that they might receive and be changed. That's how God desires to use us today. He desires us to catch the revelation that the Pergamos mindset is a mindset that's designed to not sit idle, but instead to be used to make a godly difference and a godly impact in every life that's touched. Are there any, any, any questions, any, any comments, anything so far? Praise God. So, so we look at these things in relation to the role of the church in the last days, and we see that our list is growing, and we see that everything is really pointing everything and everyone back to the first love. As the church, we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ, which means that if we're ambassadors for Christ and people are lost and looking for Christ, we don't turn their attention away from Christ to say, hey, look at me. No. Our job is to continue to point them in the right direction. We've got to be a church that's willing to point people in the right direction, not worrying about our numbers, but worrying about the number that the enemy's doing on those that might very well be looking. We got to realize as we, we add the three new points from uh, uh, the, 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 the Pergamos mindset that we've got to make God unapologetically the main thing in our lives. We got to make sure that everybody knows who we are and, 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 and who we serve. And that there's no compromise in me. There's no compromise because I'm unapologetically saved. I'm an unapologetic believer. I'm an unapologetic Christian. I'm unapologetically sanctified and Holy Ghost filled. I unapologetically speak in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. I unapologetically prophesy as the Spirit gives utterance. I unapologetically seek to exercise every ministry gift that God has entrusted to me. Not by my might or anything that I've done, but by His Spirit. That's the biggest takeaway. God wants us to understand who we are in the midst of this. God wants us to be willing and able to admit that we're sinners that are in need of salvation and be willing to lead others to do the same. God needs us to maintain an open air, heart, and spirit towards him. Because as we do these, do these things, we can then begin to go back into the earlier points to ponder. We can then uh, position people to receive the living tree of life. We can position people to know that, that they can relax in the face of trials because Christ indeed is with them. We, we can teach people to do so much more and to be a greater blessing to so many more people just by being obedient in the here and now. Obedience in our here and now is giving us such a springboard into our future and into our destiny. God desires to use us so mightily, church. And he desires us to maintain open ears and open hearts and, and open spirits towards him. He wants us to maintain those things because as we maintain those things, what God begins to do is he begins to move mightily in our lives and seeks to, to truly bless us to be the blessing that he's, blessing that he's called us to be. Amen. So, so, so we see here that, that what God desires to do is he desires to, to truly use us in ways that might seem foreign to us, in ways that might seem strange to us. They might seem a little uncomfortable. But God wants us in this season in an uncomfortable state. He wants us in a place of discomfort because it's in that place of discomfort that he can truly grow and he can truly bless and he can truly use us to be a blessing to others. It's in that state of discomfort that God is truly shining brightest in our lives as God because it's fully known to everybody that God is God and I'm not. And we're okay with that. We're okay with walking with our flaws. We're okay with seeing our scars. We're okay with that thing that might be looked at as hideous. We, I look at it as a badge of honor because it's my birthmark. The tests and trials that you face, beloved, and the victories that you win as a result of them, those scars are your battle scars. They're your medals of valor. They're your keys to victory. They're proof. They're God's living witness that he'll never leave you 
nor will they ever forsake you. And he has such a tremendous work for each of us to do. We just need to roll up our sleeves and truly be about our father's business. There are a whole lot of folks running around with this Pergamus mindset that I'm so captivated with the pomp and circumstance and with the, the carnality of the church and the worship experience that they've run the worship experience out of the church. And it's our job to go out and get it, beloved. Amen. It's our job to go out and win souls. It's our job to, to reintroduce joy and to, to reintroduce peace and to reintroduce love and to reintroduce understanding. It's our job to go forth and cry loud and, and spare not because God has work for us to do today so that we might be the blessing that he's called us to be in the lives of others. Amen. Living Witness Ministries is a church on the move that's dedicated to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through the preached and taught word, community outreach, and practical ministry designed to save souls and change lives. You can sow into the ministry via our cash app at dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. That's dollar sign LW Ministries 2020. Sow your seed in the good ground of Living Witness Ministries today. And thank you for helping us reach the world with the life-giving word. We pray that you were blessed by today's broadcast and would love to hear from you. If you have any prayer requests, praise reports, or would like to learn more about Living Witness Ministries, you can contact us by email at livingtowitness at gmail.com. That's the word living, the number two, witness at gmail.com. Or reach us by phone at area code 404 955-8846. Again, that's area code 404-955-8846. Until next time, we encourage you to continue to live your life as a living witness.